This is the Throssel Club with Norman Bartlam and Bob Downing. Well, hello and welcome to the latest edition of the Throssel Club. It's the programme which looks back on the long and illustrious history of West Bromwich Albion and we speak to former players and supporters about their memories of our marvellous club with a particular emphasis on this month in history. Now, sitting alongside me as usual is a man whose form rate is always excellent. It's the former <laughs> sports Argus man, Bob Downing. Oh, yeah. Norman, how are you? Yeah, fine, thanks. <clears throat> and your good self? Yes, yeah, fine, thank you. Excellent. And uh, sitting opposite, as always, is Black Country Radio's very own Billy Spakeman, who will be chipping in with his own comments while twiddling his knobs in the corner, <laughs> trying to keep us on ahead. <laughs> oh, yeah, we'll be back to you, lot. If I'm going to twiddle my knobs. <laughs> <laughs> and now we've got a special studio guest today, one of Bob's former colleagues on the Sports Argus, a man who may have caught the bus to get here today because he was always writing about the bus. Bishop's Buzz in the Argus, <laughs> amongst many other things. The brilliant Rob Bishop. Thank, hey. thank you very much. Great to be here. So now, Rob's watched the Albion since he was a, a little, tiny little kid and all through his life, but he's spent much of his journalistic career, and especially in later years, on doing something about a little club in Birmingham or something. Like that. <laughs> not, not far from St Andrews. But we won't let that, uh, we won't let, uh, that spoil the programme. And in fact, we have some good contributions about the Villa and no doubt they'll get a mention as well. So there's that. Loads coming up then. So welcome one and all to the February 2024 edition of the Throssel Club. <laughs> I can see Rob singing along <laughs> to that. <laughs> I can certainly <laughs> remember it at one game against Blues, where it was a Sunday lunchtime game, where I remember my intro for the, the pay for the next day was something like, uh, uh, at one end of the Hawthorns, they were fighting among themselves. At the other end, they were singing the 23rd Psalm. <laughs> <laughs> no no prizes for guessing who was the happiest. <laughs> and I think the Baggies won that one 2-0. Uh, now, <laughs> now, as a kid then, you, you watched the Albion, didn't you? Now... Tell me if this is true that I've read somewhere that your dad was a Wolves fan. Yes, yes. And he wanted to buy you a Wolves kit. He did. But he couldn't get it, a Wolves kit, so he bought you an Albion was, kit instead. It was it was socks. It was the it days socks. before replica kits. He bought me some boots. Um, <clears throat> and he would have got normally got Wolves. And it was, it was a sports shop near here, Briley Hill. Um, but they were out of stock for Wolves. And instead of leaving it till after Christmas, he got me a pair of baggies. Socks. <laughs> so I became Derek Kevin and Ronnie Allen. <laughs> yeah, no, Derek Kevin was great for you as well because didn't he score loads of goals on this, this first yes, game? Yes, yeah. Well, well Dad used to take me to, often he'd take me to Wolves and to Albion. And in fact, the first game was one at Molyneux where the baggies were three down in no time. And I think they lost 3 1. And the second game, they were two down against Everton. And I was thinking, oh, this, this isn't too clever. Every time I come, they. They don't seem to, because they were well up in the table at the time. I think they finished fourth that season. Um, but anyway, they got one back before half time. Uh, second half, run riot, 1 6 2 in the famous game. Derek Kevin scored five. Must have been fantastic. No wonder you were fixed on the Albion after that. <laughs> yeah, <correct. laughs> yeah, so journalism, you always wanted to be a journalist, did you? Yeah, know yeah, yeah. From, the, from at school, yeah. It was something I was really fancied. and... Uh, uh, eventually, I mean, I, I did go for interviews for other jobs that I was totally unsuited to, like things in computers were new at the time. And um, and then late 68, I got a job on the Dudley Herald. Uh, and I went in thinking, right, I can write about football now. But they said, well, you do the weddings, the obituaries, and you make the tea. And that's <laughs> what I did for about three months. And, uh, and, I, and I remember I first spoke to Bob early the following year uh, when the baggies had got through, in the, I can't think of the beat in the third round, but he phoned a lad called Tony Nash, a colleague of ours, and I just happened to pick up the phone, and Bob didn't know who I was, but I, I knew him because I'd obviously seen his name. Um, and he said, I'll oh, just ring him to tell him about the cup draw. I said, well, you could tell me, and uh, I think it was Fulham away at, the, at that time. And I, I think they won it, but I don't think mm. they went a lot further. Yeah. 
I mean, that's, see that what it's funny what Rob was saying there. Mm. You know, when when you start as a, as a reporter, you know, you don't go straight into the big things. I um, I had to do weddings as well when I started, um, and you get to know how to write different intros <laughs> because you can't start the wedding report off with the same line every week. Yeah. So you've got about five standard intros. You know, sort of married to St. Mar- Martin's Church on Saturday were. Um, yeah, a, ho- a honeymoon in Torquay followed the wedding of. Yeah. And you've got all these, so you have to keep mixing them around. And uh, it gives you an idea then of, of basically of the intro, how important that intro is. I, I, there's, a, there's a fellow I was, to, uh, some fellow I was talking to the other day, uh, and we're talking about journalism. And I said, the important thing, the most important paragraph of any report is the intro because that draws the reader in. Once you've drawn him in, he wants to read about the stuff. But that first paragraph is the most important you're going to write. And that's why, you know, you you can be doing a match report live and you'll change your intro three times. I mean, and Rob will know as well as, as I did. That was important. That was vital when we were on the Argus. Because if they somebody scored in the last five minutes, yeah. you're changing not only your intro, but you're changing your verdict as well. Yeah. You wanted it all wrapped up by about the 70th minute, really. Yeah. 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 Lots of people have said that to me. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah no, no doubt we'll talk about the Argus uh, a, a yeah. good fair bit uh, later in the programme. Now, lot, lots been going on. Uh, we always talk mainly about Albion's history, of course, but uh, we've had the Wolves uh, debacle. We've beaten the Blues since, and... Uh, I was lucky enough to be away for the fortnight in the Africa Cup of Nations, which was uh, absolutely brilliant. And uh, I did see one of the Albion players there, Bob, Semi AJ, playing for Nigeria. Yeah. So I looked yeah. saw him. Sadly, uh, we did watch Congo play a couple of games as well, but Gwede was on the bench for, for both of those games, although he has played in one of the other games. And at the time of rec- recording this, it's just before the semi final, so we all don't know whether either Nigeria or Congo have got through to the final. Yeah. But uh, good luck to them if they have. Who would, but, uh, carry on, though. Yeah, I was going to say, it's good experience for them. There's lots of people saying, well, what's the point of somebody like uh, Grady going there if you ain't going to get a game? But it's all part of the experience. Mm. Well, the experience. The, what they've got, to, they've got to remember, this is their World Cup. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. of course it is. Yeah, and just because it's not so well known as you, you no. knows or whatever, mm. still doesn't mean it's not important no. to them. No, it, it is important it's to them, yeah. yeah. But the atmosphere over there was absolutely unbelievable that so passionate about the football and uh, we wore our Albion tops when we wa- went to watch Nigeria and some some of the fans recognised West Bromwich Albion which is brilliant and we got our ba- baggies flag and uh, we were just surrounded being mobbed by fans just singing men from England men from England <laughs> 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 it was, it was really great, yeah. and then so, some of the sights and sounds are unbelievable but I've put together a little bit of a sound clip here and uh, if you listen to uh, different atmospheres from different grounds and you, you can hear the fans uh, singing about semi AJ and West Bromwich from England <laughs> Sound of those boo boo zailers. Oh dear, <laughs> man, it's still going through me. But they've done enough help, help to create a fantastic atmosphere. Now, uh, last week, uh, an ex Albion player was over from Hungary, Bob. Uh, yeah. One, one and only Zoltan Gira. Yeah. Now, I know you enjoyed seeing him play, didn't you? I did. I did. I mean, at the time, I was on, I'd gone from the Albion and I was doing horse racing, but I mean, you, you're still, you know, catch an Albion game when you can. You just um, see him gallop down the wing, though. Yeah. Didn't you? yeah. I mean, I mean, he was, he, oh. he was, a, you know, I mean, he was a key member of the Al, that Albion team. Um, you know, coming over from Hungary, and you know, I, I knew we wanted everybody knew we wanted to play in, play in the first division or Premier Division, and um, yeah, I mean, he, he was a he was a big hit. He was a big hit with the Albion fans. In fact, John Homer, the well-known John Homer, um, his wife had a cat. 
and she called him Zelton. <laughs> <laughs> that's how he, that's how much he, you know he, he meant, and he was. I mean, he was he was a very good player. It's, he was an integral part of that team. Yeah, brilliant. Now it was over recently, and he, one one of the things he did was uh, come across the Warwick branch of the Albion Supporters Club, mm. which is one of the the best supporters club that the Albion have yeah. got going, I think. And uh, Zoltan was there, and I met up with him beforehand and did a smash a little interview with him. And he started off talking about how it was his dream to play in the Premiership. Here we go. Then. Yeah. So, Zoltan, tell us tell us a little bit about your experiences when you you first came over to England. You you always wanted to, to play over here in the Premier League. That was uh, a dream. I thought. I'm not good enough to play in the English <laughs> football, so I was surprised when I when I had the opportunity to play in England. So, yeah, obviously it was a dream, but I thought uh, I'm not good enough for for this uh, league. And I spent ten seasons, years in in England. That was really really nice time of my life. So I'm very happy to manage. The ten seasons here. Yeah, that's brilliant. When, when you first came across here, then what was the difference between Hungarian football and uh, English football? <laughs> everything. The difference was was everything. About the tempo, uh, about the size size of the stadiums, the crowd, the the, the atmosphere, the quality. Uh, so it was totally, totally different football than than in Hungary. So I need to adapt to manage, but was everything was especially the the language was also a big different uh, but I think the first step was really good, and uh, from that point, I could play in the team uh, so back to your question, everything was was new, everything was big different. The quality, the football, the speed of the game. Uh, so yeah. So what kind of help did you get from the, from the club when you first came across here? Because it must have been really daunting to come into the club. Yeah, they tried to help me on every every way. Uh, I had the teacher. Tried to speak, you know, uh, learn the language. Uh, help me to find uh, house. Uh, cars and this kind of stuff what what is important so the club tried to support me in every single way now is that right that uh, the, the teacher that you got was uh, a wolf supporter yes frank like like he was the uh, wolverhampton supporters and uh, when when it's find out he said to me be quiet don't tell to the club <laughs> Because yeah, you didn't know about the rivalry yeah. between the two clubs at that time. I didn't know anything about that, but quickly I find out. <laughs> yeah. So, looking back on your time at the Albion, then what, what do you think was your highlight? P- possibly your debut in that first goal against Tottenham. Yes, definitely the the first start I played against Spurs it was a very good experience. Uh, scored after 5-10 minutes uh, yeah the first game was definitely when I scored yeah and what about the fans because you got on really well with the Albion fans and it must have been fantastic to hear the, the fans chanting your name yeah it was unbelievable I was surprised uh, because I thought maybe I will be a, a player in the team can play sometimes but when I heard the supporters shout my name. That was unbelievable feeling. Uh-huh. I was so happy. Uh, so, of course, as a player, you want to play well, and you want to hear the noise yeah. very often. You know, yeah. when you touch the ball, you're doing something good. You know, the supporters happy. Uh, they like your your game, like how you play. So it's very important for the players, and uh, I had lo- lots of love and uh, support from the supporters. Mm-hmm. You played under three different managers, I think, at the Elm, because it was Gary Megson to start off with. Yeah, he was the first. Uh, he gave me the opportunity to play 
in in Albion shirt, and then Brian Robson, of course, Tony Mowbray was the the manager. It was also Steve Clark as well Steve for a while, Clark, wasn't it? When, yeah. yeah, Steve Clark, uh, Roy Hodgson. So we had great managers. Uh, so they all just, got different qualities. I yeah, suppose, not just you know? good managers. Also, they've been a good, good, good people, good, good men. And of course, Tony Mowbray is back in the West Midlands now at Birmingham City. Yes, I'm looking forward. I will be in the stadium, looking forward to see uh, the reaction of the Albion supporters, how they react of Tony. Yeah. So who do you think you played your best football under? Which manager? It's difficult to say, but uh, maybe uh, Tony Mowbray and Roy Hodgson, that, that was the two best manager. And Steve Clark, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe that three managers was the was the best how we played football. Mm-hmm. And in terms of your teammates at the Albion, who, who did you really get on well with and play well with? I had many. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, because of Jonathan Greening and uh, Chris Brandt played on the left that time, it, they gave me lots of good crosses and I could score. So it was definitely, I waited for the crosses from them. Mm-hmm. But but I play with uh, different positions, of course, and uh, with the other strikers. Romelu Lukaku was with mm-hmm. us, Shane Long, uh, Kanu, even Kanu was <laughs> a very good teammate. Uh, so many, many good players. I played Jason with. Kumas you Jason played with as well, didn't you? Yeah. I know you rated Jason Kumas, didn't you? Yeah. Got good skill. Yeah, very good skill, good quality. So we had very good players. But mm-hmm. So you, you left the Albion for a while to go to Fulham and then then you, ca- you came back again? Yes. Uh, when I find out Roy Hodgson will be a manager of Albion, I I knew straight I'm gonna go, come in back. Ah, yeah, uh, that's good. And not just because of Roy Hodgson, uh, also because when we played against uh, Albion with Fulham, the the supporters they welcomed me very well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was surprised. I thought <laughs> they're gonna give me some. <laughs> Some stickers, Sticks, we say. yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, I was surprised, and I, I just said to myself, if I have a chance to come in back one day, I want to do that. So Brilliant. I was, I was lucky to to play another few seasons. Brilliant. Just tell me a little bit about what you're doing now. So you're at the under twenty, in charge of the under twenty one side for Hungary. I yes, think, yeah? yes, yes. I'm a coach now. It's a fifth year. I'm doing. Enjoying and uh, yeah, it's it's good fun and it's also a very good to see young players going through the rank and playing to the the first team, the A team. It's, that's our job, mm-hmm. basically. Yeah, so you're obviously enjoying that, I think. Yes, I enjoy. It, yes, of course. Sometimes the results not the best, but <laughs> but uh, <coughs> it's it's an experience for me. And hopefully, I will get more, more, and better results. Yeah, and so we wish uh, Zoltan and his colleagues all the best there with the the Hungary national team. Now, somebody who was always hungry for football. Oh, <laughs> golly. <laughs> Hi. What, has he been, pra- no, no. been practicing these? <laughs> Oh, okay, let's just go straight into you again then, Bob. So you've got some good memories from your early days of watching the Albion. Yes, yeah. I mean, as I say, Dad took me to Wolves and to Albion. He took me to Villa one one time. Uh, it was a game where um, Clive Clark got sent off for fighting with Harry Burrows and Villa won 2 nil. And about a year after that, September the following year, we went to Man United. And, uh, I mean, it was a, I'll never forget the day, glorious afternoon, and we stood actually on the Stratford end, and just before kick-off, you got the announcement, obviously very different in those days, where the team was in the programme, and the, it came on the Tannoy. Um, a team change today in place of number seven uh, for United, Moyer, uh, which is Moyer, 
will be best. And clearly nobody had a clue, and I certainly didn't, who this lad was. Well, he spent most of the first half being kicked by Graham Williams. <laughs> so <laughs> so they, they actually switched him, Mad Busby switched him to the, the other wing for the second half. And after that, it was just, it was a very poor game. Uh, Albion lost 1 0. Uh, but I remember over the years then, I saw him quite a bit, and obviously we all know what a great player he, he became. But the one thing I always regretted was that, A, I didn't keep the programme from that game, although his name wasn't in it, but it was still a historic moment. Uh, also, there was no footage. Uh, but the BBC, what they, they cheat every time they do a documentary on Best, and they say he made his debut against West Brom, and then they show some footage of a game against Albion. But the game they show... Is, is is at the Hawthorns about three years later. It was a 4-3 to United. And they show him not making number three, as if it's Graham Williams. It's actually Ian Collard. So they, <laughs> they cheat a bit with that one. Ah, yeah. to look out for. Yeah. So that is worth... I, I did have um, I, I had that. Somebody lent it me uh, from Villa Park. Uh, and I took it home and watched it. And a mate of mine called John Moncton, uh, who uh, is an equally... You know, he's very keen on Albion, and he said, "Oh, I'd love to see that." And he borrowed it and taped Coronation Street over it. <laughs> <laughs> so, if anybody's got a copy of that, <laughs> please do get in touch because Bob's desperate to, to uh, watch it again. <laughs> but the, the f when I started working, um, the, I remember the, the first game. I initially did non-league football. Darlaston was my very first game. In fact, it was 55 years ago. Last month, January. Oh, congratulations, yeah. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it was my first <laughs> game. Uh, but then, uh, later that year, Bob was doing Albion for the, the Chronicle and the, the Dudley Herald series at the time. Uh, and uh, he, he must have been unwell or he'd got to go somewhere else, but he'd booked a coach seat to go to Coventry for a midweek game early on. I think it was only about the second game of the season. Um, and he'd got the press pass sorted, so he asked me if I wanted to go instead. Uh, so I, I went in Coventry, so it was Coventry against Albion was my first one, and Gordon Nisbet was in goal. What was the date of that, Rob? It was August, ooh, 69. 69? Uh, August 69, yeah. I, haven't got, I didn't make a note of the exact date, but it would be about 20-something or something. I'm just trying to think how old my son is. Because that might have been when Matthew was, was born. Oh, right. oh possibly, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, no, we Coventry won three. Willie Carr played particularly well for them, and they won three one. But uh, but I just remember Nisbet being in goal, and of course, he later, as we know, made his career as a fullback. Didn't yeah, he? yeah. Well, it's uh, fun, funny you should say about Gordon Nisbet being in goal because we've got a nice little story coming up about goalkeepers now, and it's not loads of people probably know this, but it's quite a few that, that wouldn't. It Graham Williams. Actually yeah, played in goal for West Brom. Can you remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cup title, Southampton. Yeah, Southampton yeah. back in 1968. Now, one of the things we like to do on this program is to talk some of to some of our older listeners, and uh, we've got two people in particular, Rex Edwards and Ken Lord, who've got some really great memories that we've used in the past, Bob, uh, Rob. And uh, this is Rex now. He's, he's talking about that FA Cup game in 1968. It was FA Cup replay at Southampton. And Graham Williams ended up being goal after John Osborne was mm -hmm. injured. Yeah. OK, Southampton in the Cup beginning. I think it was the year we won it again. I, why not? I put everything down to the year we, won, we beat Everton. But anyway, we were one nil down, I think. You'll have to check it all out, obviously. But one nil down. And uh, our goalkeeper was injured. And I can't even remember if it was John Osborne or Norman Heath. Uh, I've gone too far back with Norman Heath, I think. And no, no substitutes at all. So it carried off. And um, Graham Williams, the captain, the left back, went in goal. And uh, he kept them out. He kept them out, all the us, and Jeff won the game. You must have thought that was it then when the goal came Well, you do. It, it did in those days because it yeah. made such a difference. It's not like now, is it? They bring on seven other players. Yeah. You know, I mean, those days he played with ten. And uh, one of the outfielders went in goal. Yeah, so, so Graham Williams did quite well. Yeah, and he phoned here. Only uh, he phoned here only um, what? Covid. Oh, one of the COVID just after calls. Covid. Yeah, about I believe it. Could two years ago. No, I couldn't. Be couldn't believe it when he came on. But I knew he was almost straight away. That's uncanny, really, because I'd never met him. 
and he was a good solid left back and captain, really good. And um, anyway, he just phoned up. He didn't. He didn't know I'd been to, and I was able to say just what I just to you now. Did you say to him? And he was, <laughs> yeah, I said, and he was absolutely amazed that I was at that game really, and um, <laughs> saw him in goal because yeah. he said I was much of a goal. I said, you, oh, you were, and he was. He was. He stopped all the all the silly shots. Anyway, you know. On the train back, there was a, another another guy who'd been to the game, hadn't yeah, he? And he uh, was really pleased about it, and couldn't couldn't believe we'd we got we'd done it because Southampton were good then. Really good. And we were away from home, so it was good. Brilliant. Some great memories there from Rex from February 1968. And staying with the February theme, Ken's uh, memory this week is also from uh, this month. This month in 1954. Now, 1954, Bob Albin famously won yeah. the FA Cup, of course, didn't they? Yeah. And uh, Ken was at the Hawthorns for one of the FA Cup games when there was, can you believe this, 61,000 at, at the ground? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I can believe it because I mean Newcastle. I mean they had such a tremendous following, and I mean they, they had also such a tremendous cup record. Yeah, you know, and um, yeah, sixty. Can you imagine sixty-one thousand in the Hawthorns? Mm -hmm. Just astonishing, astonishing, isn't it? But let's have a listen now to uh, to Ken's memory. Did you manage to get to any of these matches? Because you were still in the army, weren't you? One Newcastle yeah. game. But the Newcastle game was one of the famous games, wasn't it? With Whoa. Ronnie Allen got his hat trick in that yes. one, didn't he? It was one of the best games I've ever seen. It was at everything. It was a cup toy, it was a... Both teams attacking, you know, brilliant football, beautiful goals, and a dead... Right at the end, three or four minutes from the end, your heart was in your mouth. Of course, Newcastle. We were 3 2 up then, and, and then Newcastle was. Attacking, I, I never let the Albion get long off for the last 10 minutes. Even the goalkeeper were coming down for a call, you know, what they do these days. But to the, I thought, we haven't got to last out another five minutes for you all right. And that was the longest five minutes I've ever known as a football match. But every was, time Newcastle went over the wall for a long time, I was I'm going to get another goal and take us away. <laughs> but no, good defending, we kept them out. And that was it. And there's a huge attendance as well for that 61,000? Uh, well, I thought it's 60,000 at least. And uh, that's the biggest ground I've ever been at the Albion ground. And then, yeah, how they got 61,000 into that game, I'll never know. When they think the record is 64,000 plus, where did the other 4,000 come? What was it like being in that crowd? Oh, dear me. I like a sardine. <laughs> You know, but luckily, that was the bummy I was in. I had a good view, you know. But uh, every time something happened, you can get yourself squeezed in because everybody, you know, moved. You know, I was like being one of them barricades, which is in these days. I got light in front, so I thought. One well, of the crash barriers. That's yeah, the yeah, crash yeah. barrier. And I thought, I'd be safe here, like. But you know, yeah. I. Sometimes I wonder then whether the craft party is going to collapse. You know, but, uh, yeah. oh, but that's how it was such a. And that goal Alan scored, George Lee took a corner, and Alan standing on the edge of the penalty area, as he came over, without the ball touching the ground, he just scored on the volley and right in the top corner. All the crowd went mad. You know, such a beautiful goal. And put the album into a 3 2, 3 1 lead. And then when Newcastle got to, what was after half time, they made 3 2. And after that, as the album was going, it was just fight to the death and keep the lead. And that last five minutes, I thought, oh, okay. But now they managed it, and that was it. Brilliant stuff there from Ken. Now, I'm putting a book together for Ken at the moment because th this April, it's the 80th anniversary, would you believe, of his going to his very first game. It was a mm -hmm. wartime, mm -hmm. wartime uh, league game against Nottingham Forest. Mm -hmm. And his memory of things from the past is absolutely brilliant. That's great. So, looking forward to trying to get that book out, hopefully, for April. It might be a little bit later at this rate yeah. because uh, he's got so many memories. It's just going to be a little tiny little booklet to start with, but... Could be a great volume at this rate. <laughs> the way that we're going up. Uh, talking of books, of course, you've done a few yourself, Bob. Yeah. Sadly, I've, I've never done a, an Albion book. I've done uh, I've done a couple with Steve Wool, 
and the rest have all been villa connected. Yeah, that's, some of them uh, made big coffee table type books as yes, well, raising a bit of money for their former yeah, players. Yes, association the latest the one is the hundred. It's the hundred and fiftieth anniversary of this year of the club. And it wasn't my idea, a lad called John Farrelly, who's a very keen collector. Uh, he said, wouldn't it be great if we could have a, a team squad from every season, certainly those available, the early days, they didn't have them. Mm -hmm. But we've got, we start with 1880 and goes right through to the current squad. And he's also got an amazing collection of memorabilia. And we've populated the other pa pages with uh, pictures of those. And uh, I mean, it costs 30 quid, but it's a lovely book. And we, we've just done 1874 copies because that's the year the club was formed. I, I can see a good idea here for yeah, the Albion in about four years' go. time. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And basically, it's, it's, we, we reckon we've sold already about 1,500, and we're giving 50% of all the profit to the former Players' Benevolent Fund. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah. That's worked really good. Yeah. Now, which brings us nicely on to uh, a new Albion book that's coming out that uh, Albion photographer Laurie Rampling. Oh, of course, is, is the Cyril Regis. Yeah. About, yeah. About, mm. uh, yes, I've ordered Cyril that. Cyril Regis. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a big 30 quid book as yes. well. But uh, yeah. I, was, I was talking to Laurie about it, and he, he was saying similar things to you about some the quality of some of the photographs. Yes. That yeah. are in it. Well, Laurie actually helped with the Villa one as well. Oh, you know, he did some yeah. of the, because the, John knows him as well. So. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm glad. I think he's gone for a hardback um, because I, I've seen one or two other ones with the Derek Kevin and a Bobby Hope one, and they were great books. But I just felt with with the landscape shape, a soft cover doesn't work unless you've got it on a table. Mm. Trying to read it is not yeah. is not easy. Yeah. Uh, so, that, but the hard book hardback makes it. Well, this one's certainly going to be which, a hardback. Yes. And, yeah. uh, I, I sat down uh, in one of the, the boxes at, at the Albion re recently overlooking the pitch where they've got that big picture of Cyril in, in the stands and uh, let uh, Laurie wax lyrical, as they say, about his memories of Cyril Regis and about the book. So, Laurie, you've got this new book coming out then all about Cyril. Yes, Norman. Uh, and as we sit here um, on the Regis Suite balcony, overlooking the ground, looking at the picture of the great man himself, in the corner, scoring his goal against Norwich back in 82. Picture that I might add has, has gone around the world and uh, uh, and has been appreciated by everybody. It's quite appropriate that we uh, we talk about the new book on Cyril that, for want of a better term, is a warts and all of his complete career from, the, from his days in Harlesden, um, Stonebridge, where he came from, up to his... Final days here uh, at the at the Hawthorns in uh, on New Year's Eve, uh, 2017, when he walked out of the Cyril Regis uh, suite door, and that was the last time I saw my mate. And to get a phone call after after the Bobby Hope book, that is, uh, to get a phone call from my publisher Stuart Curtis and asking me to uh, to write a book about Cyril, it probably took me, you know. Uh, about 30 seconds to make a decision in my mind uh, that it was absolutely the right thing to do uh, to record the life of probably one of the most iconic footballers, not just West Bromwich Alwyn players, but footballers in the game ever um, because Cyril came along at a time where racism wasn't very pleasant um, it was something that he wore well. It was something he took on the chin. It's something, if you like, he actually laughed back at, you know, because he used it as a weapon, as a tool to inspire himself to do well. Um, but the irony of it was that on that famous night here against Rotherham in the League Cup, you know, he didn't really have to do much other than put in a performance that was a world beater to convince the Albion fans that the new king, the new hero of of the terraces was here. Yeah, because that was his debut, of course, wasn't it? That was you his didn't debut. Need to do any more than score on your debut. And no, no, and and the fact that when we got the penalty, um, and I, I, I'm not sure who was going to take it. It might have been maybe Gary Owen. I can't remember. But all around the ground was Cyril, take it, Cyril, Cyril. You know, and to stand, and that was the only penalty he took 
for West Bromwich Albion Football Club. Is that right? That's right. I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, and uh, yeah, much like Derek Kevin, you know, he you know he didn't he didn't like taking penalties, so he didn't. So and upset Cyril, slots it away, and uh, the rest, as I say, is history. Um, it's been a labour of love, Norman. Um, I've shed tears with Michelle. Um, I've uh, had m- moving moments with Beverly, his first wife. Uh, I've had great moments with his mates down at Halston, uh, Mark Steen being one in particular. Uh, they, were, they were really big buddies. Um, and it's been a privilege to be able to talk to everyone in the family, including David, his, his brother, um, about Cyril's life. And, it, and, and, and the book covers not just the, the fame side of it, but, you know, the, the hard slog side of it, you know, is because, you know, he had to work hard at getting to where he was, you know, because he was raw, he was unadulterated, if you like, you know, and, you know, no one really knew too much about him, but he soon put that right. And I think, I would like to think that I've actually covered that in the book. And, and you know, not just, not just with Albion, but then his days at Coventry, uh, then his days at Villa, then his days at Wolves, Wickham, Chester, his final days. And, 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 I, and, and one of the things that I've noted all the way along that is that he inspired people at every stage of his career, even to Chester. Uh, when he was at Wickham, you know, he, you know he, he was not an unknown quantity, but, you know, the manager there then was the uh, Martin O'Neill. And he, he took Cyril on board just on, uh, you know, reputation alone, if you like. And I think that, that says a lot about Cyril, the player, yeah. as well as a man. You know, I'm, and I just hope that, you know, the people who buy it will appreciate, um, you know, what Cyril's life was all about. And if I've got to be honest, it's a stunning book. Yeah. You know, but the, the design team at, at Curtis Sport have done a fantastic job. You know, young Adrian Hewlett, he's 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 made it. Every page you open, wow. Mm-hmm. You know, um, there is a. You know, there is that wow impact, if you like. And there's loads of pictures in it that people have never have seen before. Yeah, there? yeah, yeah. I decided that what I, want, what I wanted to do is... It's, the thing is, it's going to be £30 for the book because it's a hardback. Because it's so big and heavy, it's got to be hardback. So, and I wanted to give back to the people who are going to be wedging out their 30 quids something slightly different. So I've been right from my archive and I've dug out... I dug out nearly 200 pictures, uh, to be honest, that I'd never ever printed or, you know, b- bothered putting out there. Because what I used to do, I only used to print probably a dozen or 20 per match and send it off to the club to use. Um, but now I've gone back through my whole archive and I've put in there around about 60 pictures that have never seen, never been seen before. So... That in itself, you'll open the pages and well, wow, you know. Yeah, and even, I can't be honest with you, yeah, even me looking at them, I look, I don't remember taking that, you yeah. know. Uh, did I take that? You know, but I did, because they're my negatives, so <laughs> yeah. I must have done. Because yeah. back in the day when I was sitting here with black and white, you know, it was, it was a case of getting here early, doing a couple of little jobs that Tony Matthews might have wanted me to do. And then at the end of the game, it was all about getting down to uh, to New Street Station and getting on the train back to London, mm-hmm. um, which ironically is where I first met Cyril and travelled back to London with him, with him and David, um, and we pretty much um, knew each other's life stories throughout by the time we drew into mm-hmm. Euston Station. <laughs> so and that's where we that's when we became friends, and we remain so for the rest of our lives. And as I said, in on New Year's Eve, 2017, Arsenal here. Cyril was in the suite. We had a nice dinner together, um, and then after the game, he walked through that door, 
and little did I know that would be the last time I would see my mate. So I would like to think that this book is a homage to him um, and to all the new Albion fans that never saw Cyril play, I hope that the book brings out what Cyril Regis was all about. Yeah, I'm sure it will as well. So uh, I'm really looking forward to, to getting that book, as uh, mm. you, you two have said as well. So let's go back to your early days then, Rob, about uh, following the Albion yeah. and reporting on the Albion. Go back well, to the as, I, as I say, I started with a Coventry game, which is very much a one-off, but not that long after Bob left and joined the Warsaw Observer. At that point, I, I took over doing the column for our group of papers. Uh, in fact, I'll just look at Bob's brought in... Um, a, a page, a cutting from 1970. Good, and great to say got, that page is yellow. It <laughs> is an understatement. <laughs> and we've got a picture of uh, Kenny Hibbert, Asa Hartford, Colin Suggett's on there. Um, but it's all overshadowed. Right across the top uh, is the West Bromwich District League, so it's almost like as if they were far <laughs> more important than the baggies. But, but what, what was <laughs> important in that paper, as well as in the Sports Argus, that that's exactly what the papers were all about? Local community, local, yeah. lo lo yeah. local stuff, which yeah. Yeah. which you don't get today. With these, no, no, the way, these, you know, they don't get a mention there, yeah. do they? Yeah, so no, but I did, I did all of that. But I also did um, some what we used to call lineage for other papers. And my regular Saturday was to go to Spring Road, cover the uh, third team in the Intermediate League. Um, and I used to do that for the Sporting Star, the, the Argus, the Sunday Mercury. And then I'd go and have a spot of lunch in West Brom. Then to the Hawthorns, which could have been for either the first team or the reserves, which again I did for other papers. But at that time, I got to know John Truig very well. Oh, right, yeah. He was, I think he was only 15, but he was knocking in lots of goals. I, I remember he told me he, he used to get £12 a fortnight. That was his <laughs> salary, £12 a fortnight. But uh, I mean, I, I was probably on about 15, 20 quid a week anyway. It wasn't, you know, great money then, but. Um, but he always took an interest in what I wrote, and I think he—I I know he got ridiculed for that comment in China about oh, you've yeah. seen one wall, you've seen them. But he, but he was really quite articulate, uh, and he used to take an interest. He said, "How sh how should we write this report? What should we do here?" Um, and he also liked—we uh, played golf. We used to go to San he used to get me onto Sandwell Park golf course, uh, and he liked. The bird, bird is of the other description as well, the feathered variety. <laughs> and uh, the, I should never forget one day we, we, we drove at this one hole. He went down on the edge of the left, I went on the right, neither in the middle you notice. Uh, and uh, as I went to my bag, um, he called me over and said, Rob, Rob, over here. And uh, I looked over, I could, there's no sign of him, I've seen his bag. And then I realised he'd clambered up a tree. He said, there's some, there's some young uns in this nest. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> and, and another occasion, that, um, he disappeared from view at, at one hole, and it was a deep bunker. He must have been there two or three minutes, and the ball never came out. So I went round to look at what was happening, and he was building up a mound of sand to put the ball on. I said, you, you can't do that. <laughs> he said, well, I've tried three or four times anyway, so I'm going I'm to cheat. Um, but he, he also told me something that didn't come to pass, but it, it, it gives an indication of how, how shall we say, um, fickle the game can be almost, and you know things can go your way, and a good player could, could get nowhere, and a very a poor player can almost make it. But anyway, um, after a, it was a Youth Cup tie derby, uh, we were travelling back, and he was giving me his usual opinion on my report, uh -huh. and, and he said, uh, oh, a couple of the lads are going to be released at Christmas. Uh, one of them was a Scottish winger called Billy Thomas, and the other was a midfield lad called Brian Robson. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and I wasn't surprised totally when he told me that, because a lot of the time, Brian used to stand with me on the touchline when I covered those 13 games, because he couldn't get in that team. So it wasn't, you know, so he was only on the fringes and not really making impact. But then sometime the following year, he, he stayed as it happened. Sometime the following year, he went on a England youth tour. And the rest, as we know, is history. And uh, just amazing the way his career went. Yeah, brilliant. Mm. Now then, this is the moment you've been waiting for, Billy. <laughs> 
It's the quiz of the week. <laughs> I've got me black country pen as well. <laughs> okay. Right, come on then. We never have a prize, do we? No, no. We sure have a I think prize. I ought to. Well, I should have had one for Christmas, shouldn't yeah. I? Because I was a brilliant one at Christmas. No, the, the, the I think you should maybe have a wool sock and a baggy sock. <laughs> and a sock yeah. Somebody has yeah, to yeah, take it. Somebody has back. to wear yeah. it. Have you still got them, Rob? Right, just shout. <laughs> just shout out the answers. Okay, number one here. The last time Albion played the Villa was in April 2021 behind closed doors. Who were the respective managers? Uh, 21. 20, 20, 20, 20. Um, that'd be... Dean, um, Dean, Smith. D- Dean Smith. Smith. Mark? Yeah, and... and the, oh, I can't... Not Ozzy or Dealers, was it? No, 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 no it was the, <laughs> the Serb. What was his name? No, it wasn't. No? no. Big, bigger than that. Darren Moore. No, bigger, bigger than that. Darren Moore, bigger than Darren Moore. Well, not Muslim wise but... Big wise, big chewing his gum all the time. Sam Allardyce. Sam Allardyce. Oh, oh two nil two. lead. Well, two. I, I, I forgot all about <laughs> Sam Allardyce. Yeah. Like a lot of the Albion fans, <laughs> wish they could. Right. He's an older one for you, Bob. In October 1935. Oh crap! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, the Albion thrashed the Villa seven nil. But who scored four for the Albion? WG. WG Richardson Ooh, indeed. Right. Was that the four in five minutes? Yeah. What well, bonus so, point for that? Give him a bonus point okay. for that as well, yeah? Chief. Right, next one. Who, which striker in the 1980s played for Wolves, Albion and Villa? John Dean. No. He went on to be a TV pundit. Andy Gray? Andy Gray. Oh! oh me! Really? <laughs> one, one for Blackstock. Right. <laughs> oh, well Black Country well Radio, there we are. Award winning <laughs> radio station. Right. I, think, I think you should, you should have extra mark for that. I think you've been, been the only one that got that. Okay. okay. That's okay. brilliant. Right, which goalkeeper left the Albion to join the Villa in 1971? He's been up. Played for Tranmere as well. Jimmy Coombs. Jimmy Coombs. Ooh. Jimmy I should have got that. Yep. In September 2007, which Albion man moved from the Albion to the Villa with some of his fee going to his former club at Luton? Oh, God. Mm. I just it's me. Boxed him. Kurt. Begins with a C. Kurt, Kurt, Kurt. 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 Keith Curl. No. Curtis, Curtis Davis. Oh, Curtis Davis. Curtis Davis. Is that half a point? Because you had to prompt it. Yes, I was prompted. Yeah, I was just cook, 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 cook. I'll just cook, cook, cook on that. Now, Albion and Villa played each other in two FA Cup finals in the 1880s. One game each, but where were the finals played then, 1887? Kennington Oval. Kennington Oval. And the Crystal Palace. Well, both Kennington Oval, I think it was. Um, yep. Oh, those so, two. Yeah. Th- 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 those two particular ones. Oh, oh sorry. Oh, the third, yep. was, the third yeah. was. Yeah. yeah. We'll give. We'll give, a, give half, half a point because it's po- half a point extra that. information. Who <laughs> was the former Albion goalkeeper who was on loan at Villa from Liverpool before signing for the Albion? Scott Carson. Scott Carson. Good. Yeah. How are we doing for the scores, then, Billy? Level, level Ooh. pegging because of two halves. I think we should have a tiebreaker. Tiebreak. Yeah. Ooh, let's think if we Four each. I think we can have, think of a question for the tiebreaker now. Now, it's an interesting one. I wonder if you can remember this because you wrote the story of... Right, so you've got an <laughs> oh, a bit of a advantage on this one. Not to do with the Albion or the Villa, uh-huh. but headline of the evening mail after the World Cup in 1990. Well, sorry, it was to do with the Villa. The headline is Villa go for... Beckenbauer. Oh, right, sorry, oh. that was... Oh. Yeah, so that gives it... I did well five, four... <laughs> Five, to five Rob Bishop. Goals, five goals to four. This thing about. Two. I could give Bob my bonus. I could give Bob my points. <laughs> couldn't I? Shall we do that? Yeah, go on. Shall then. I get. Yeah, and then it's a draw, in it? Yeah. Okay. So, so I'm going to gift my Bring to Bob. Bob. And then five goodness. each. Together. Five each. Five. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there we go. That's as many as I've ever got. <laughs> What about this Franz Beckenbauer story then? Uh, obviously, it didn't happen, but obviously no, it, it was on no. the cards. Uh, I, mean, I, I, got, I was ridiculed. I mean, it was one of those stories where it was wrong, obviously. So, uh, as I say, you don't well, believe. Some factual but it was based it. on a good tip-off. 
uh, and I did speak to someone inside the club, I'm not saying who, uh, and I, while I, I didn't have any sort of confirmation, I wasn't dissuaded from writing it, so I thought, well, I think this is... And if you think of the story said, it's a target, not they're going to get him. Uh, but it, it sent my reputation soaring because everybody was talking about that story. So yeah. I was quite uh, almost <laughs> pleased that, you know, not that it didn't happen, but even though it didn't, it you know, it helped me along. And yeah. um, But Doug Ellis, in, in a book he wrote some years later, did confirm it. Uh, he was talking about something else, and suddenly there was a paragraph which it said something like, I can't think what the subject was, but he said it reminded me of when I tried to get... Uh, Franz Beckenbauer to yeah. go to Villa as manager. Right. That's great. So that was all, so almost one of the greatest scoops. Almost, it, it could have been, <laughs> yes. Yeah, we got Dr. Joe Vengloss instead, who <laughs> sadly oh. didn't work out. And, but he was a lovely guy. He was, uh, yeah. In fact, I'd, I'd arranged to play tennis with him just before he decided he, I think it was mutually decided he, uh, yeah. uh, he, he wasn't going to carry on. Brilliant. Yeah, more, more coming up then. Uh, let's have another look now, or another listen, at some of the things that have happened in this month. And we're going back now to 1890. This week in 1890, West Bromwich Albion played Burton Wanderers in the Staffordshire Cup at Stony Lane. The local press stated the game was entirely confined to the visitors' quarters, which is one way of saying it was a bit one-sided. By half-time, the Baggies were 9-0 up and went on to win convincingly. Four players scored hat-tricks and Billy Bassett did even better, scoring six times. Even the goalkeeper Roberts joined in to score one of the goals. Final score, West Bromwich Albion 23, Burton Wanderers 0. You don't get 23 nil victories these days. If only <laughs> no. you could, if only you could. Now, staying back in uh, days gone by, 150 years ago, and uh, it was the birth in Cradley of somebody called Steve Bloomer, who is a well known name in the black country. Does it ring a uh, bell with you, you two at all? I never saw it in play. No, you <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think you're denying that a little bit too much, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Steve, Steve Bloomer, big black country guy, uh, went on to play for England and, and Derby. Really great uh, England career. And he's also had the honour of scoring the first ever goal at the Hawthorns when it opened in September. Isn't there a, a plaque to him somewhere? Yeah, there's a little little plinth uh, in Cradley yeah. uh, on the edge of the River Stour. And uh, one of Albion's uh, oldest fans, Harry Taylor, who's been on this programme, yeah. hasn't he, Bob? Yeah, he, he lives nearby, so he's a Mr. Cradley man. So don't get Cradley and Cradley. No. Oh, no. No, <laughs> no, no way. Safe. Unfortunately, I did, of course. <laughs> yeah, so I, I met up uh, with Harry by the plaque, and he told me a little bit about Steve Bloomer. We're in the Stowe Valley at the border between Cradley and Cradley Heath, and this plaque here marks the location of Bridge Street, which is where Steve Bloomer was born and a good local man and big Albion fan of many of yours is Harry Taylor and Harry's with us now and Harry you know a little bit about uh, Steve Bloomer and his history don't you? Well uh, this is the place where Steve Bloomer was born, uh, Bridge Street, Cradley which I presume ran uh, across, across, here, yeah, across here, yeah, yeah. As, I'm just presuming because we're right by the, by the River Stour which is just uh, 20 or 30 yards from us so he was born here, and uh, as everybody knows, who knows a bit about football, he was uh, a very famous footballer. I think when he was about six years old, his dad moved and worked in an iron foundry in Derbyshire. So that's how we got to him up there. And he was um, an icon at Derby County, and also Middlesbrough and England. So he played 23 games for England on the plaque here and scored 28 goals, which is absolutely incredible, if you think it's about it. an astonishing record. He was very, a very slight figure, apparently really, really slim. Got a fantastic shot in either foot, apparently, and uh, he could hit the ball like a, cannon, like a cannonball. And the uh, sad thing was, uh, when he retired, he did some coaching out in Germany, and the First World War started, and he was took prisoner at the whole of the war, like. 
Now the name Steve Bloom is quite well known in the black country, obviously it's probably because he's from here, but also he's got significance with West Bromwich Albion, hasn't he? Yes, us being baggy supporters, uh, when they built the Hawthorns in 1900, the first match was in September versus Derby County. It was a one-all draw and Steve Bloomer scored the first goal. But so yeah, really iconic figure, Stevie Bloomer. Yeah, Stevie Bloomer there scoring the first goal at, at the Albion in that 1-1 uh, one, one draw and it was Chippy Simmons, I think, who scored the Albion goal, the first Albion player to score at the Hawthorns. Now going back to first, uh, Rob and Bob, when did you first start working together? We actually started on the, the same, well we'd worked together on the, the weekly paper and the Express and Star but never in the same office. <clears throat> and then we both left the Express and Star at the same time. I don't think either of us realised initially that Bob had got the Albion job with the, the mail mm. and I'd, I'd been recruited to do Speedway and <clears throat> excuse me, non-league football. Um, so we started together. It was 2nd of April, 79. Should have been the first, but that was a Sunday. So we always <laughs> we escaped the April Fools. And I, I at the time, thought, well, he's, he's got the, the good gig. He's got the baggies. I've just got, not that I've got complaints, but I've got non-league football and speedway. But I think I did rather better. Yeah, you over, did. <laughs> over over oh, the I... next few years, I, I went to Wembley <clears throat> uh, four times. Once with Hales Owen, sorry, once with Will and All, three times with Hales Owen. Uh, I went to Poland, Sweden, Germany, Amsterdam for World Speedway Finals. And as you know, the baggies at the, t the time were in decline. And there was one occasion where uh, I, I recall they couldn't afford the coach to go to Luton. And it ended up with Bob. Wow. Sorry, we're not. <laughs> but yeah. they, they had Tell a, you what we'll do. We, we talk, talk like this for ages and ages, but we're <clears> running out of time, yes. unfortunately. So thanks very much. No problem. And thank you for being with us as well, Bob. And we need to go. This is the Throssel Club with Norman Bartlam and Bob Downing.